As the Father sent me, so send I you to bear witness of me in spirit and truth. Everywhere you go, I'll go there before you. Every time you speak, my words will be there. Even if you fall, my hand will uphold you and guide you home. Though the gates of hell may open against you and the lion seeks to devour your soul, put your trust in me, I'll never, never fail you or leave you alone. As I said a little bit ago, since the last time I was able to share the Word of God with you, uh, this has been in my heart. I didn't know exactly which scripture passage and I spent time in prayer and felt led to the passage of Scripture I'm going to be sharing with you today. We're going to be sharing the whole chapter in Isaiah chapter 59, except for the last verse. So we're there today. Isaiah chapter 59. It goes without saying that the year 2020 has been unlike any year any of us have ever experienced. At least that's true. It seems true for most of us. We've seen the coronavirus pandemic shutting down businesses or businesses only being partially open restaurants being only partially open, and churches shut down and closed as well. People wearing masks in public, and as uh, our dear sister was telling me this morning, she was chuckling how that there used to be a day where you would never be welcome in a bank with a mask on, and now you're going to come with a mask on. So, 2020 has been unlike any year we have experienced. Uh, we've seen insurrection and chaos in our major cities. We've seen irresponsible mayors failing to protect their communities. We've seen governors impose strict re uh, legislation causing economic distress. Mm -hmm. We've seen Black Lives Matter, which was formulated by a communist and is said to have communist infiltrators, even to the point where now there's a movement on to defund the police, which is about as brainless as you can be. Yeah, I'm mad. <laughs> We've seen the rise of terrorist organizations like Antifa, a homeland terrorist organization. We've seen nightly propaganda espoused by our news media. On and on and on it goes. You get the idea. There's relenting or unrelenting evil going on all around us. If we ever needed a sure word from the Lord, it's now. Amen. 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 At the time Isaiah penned Isaiah chapter 59, the nation of Judah was in utter spiritual ruin. Things got to the point where God said that he would not even listen to their prayers. I take you to Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not God is not obligated to hear our prayers, friend. Every so often you will hear someone 
would say, prayer changes things. That's not always true. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 44. You, that is God, you have covered yourself with a cloud that prayer should not pass through. And Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 16. Therefore, God says, therefore, do not pray for this people, nor lift up a cry or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. It's a very serious matter, very serious, when God tells us not to pray. Sin was so rampant in the nation of Judah that God's face, God's favor, was hidden from them. You could be sure God was looking at them. God could see. But they could not see God. Their sins had separated them from God. And God's face was hidden from them. And while Isaiah chapter 59 was written about the southern kingdom of Judah, it reads like it is talking about first 21st century America. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In verses 3 through 8, it speaks of the depravity of the times in which we live. You look at word, uh, verses 3 through 8, and you'll find words like hands, fingers, lips, tongue, and feet. And all these words describe for us individuals who are truly depraved. Now, a depraved person is one who is corrupt. A person who's perverse, a wicked person, is a depraved person. Now, while most of us have all of our, our we have our hands, we have our fingers, we have lips, feet, and a tongue, Depraved people use their fingers, hands, lips, tongue, and feet in ways that are wicked, that are perverse, and that are corrupt. So here we are in verse 3. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. What would your hand be without your fingers? Now, it is through the use of our fingers that any purpose is executed. Millions of babies have been aborted by the hands of physicians whose calling it is to save lives. Widespread anarchy in our nation has snuffed out the lives of scores of people. Look at verse 6, the latter part of the verse. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. No respect for law and order. Morale among our civil servants is at an all-time low. Many are now taking an early retirement or just plain quitting the police force. All the while, looters, murderers, and rioters wreak total havoc in our cities. The prophet continues in verse 7. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their path. Their feet
destroy federal building, buildings and police precinct buildings. And at this point, I would just like to offer a word of counsel from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 10 through 19. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us work secretly for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol or like the grave and like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in your lot among us. Let us all have one purse. My son, do not walk with them. Do not walk in the way with them. Keep your foot from their path. For their feet run to evil. And they make haste to shed blood. Avoid the path of evildoers. There are organizations or people who are paying some of these looters, these rioters to wreak havoc. Do not participate in their evil practices. For God Almighty sees it. God Almighty is in control. And God Almighty knows who you are. Amen. You will bring pain to others and harm to you if you participate. Look at verse 3, the latter part of the verse. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has uttered perversity. Verse 4, no one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. Not only do the depraved sin by what they do, they sin by what they say. A depraved person has no qualms about lying or speaking perversely. You can almost hear the prophet Isaiah's voice thundering, No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for that is to say, no one was going to the court for the purpose of truth and justice. Their interest instead was to take undue advantage of others, even to the point of injuring them in the courtroom. And rather than stand for truth and justice, they often become evasive and display eccentric behavior in the courtroom. Verse 4, they trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. Last year, 2019, Lori, I guess her name is Laughlin, Laughlin, and her husband, she's an actress, she and her husband were two of three people charged with conspiracy. Mm -hmm. Their scheme was to use bribery and fraud to secure admission for their children to 11 different universities. It was revealed as a nationwide college entrance exam cheating scandal. Mm -hmm. And this week, she was sentenced, I think, to two months in prison. Is it any wonder why so many people place so little value on telling the truth when yeah. adults, when parents have no qualms about lying and presenting and, and deceiving people? Verses 5 and 6, they hatch vipers' eggs and weave the vipers and spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies, and from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. 
Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hand. In these two verses, we have two pictures. The first picture is that of a snake hatching eggs. When the egg is cracked open, a brood of reptiles appears. And what a picture this is of liars hatching more liars. They have no qualms about telling a lie. Those who are influenced by them and follow them become liars as well. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 12, verse 34. Brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Jesus added these. Matthew 23, verse 33. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? Just as vipers have poison under their tongues, so do depraved sinners reveal their evil nature by what they say and what they do. There's another word picture afforded us in verse 6. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity. Just as a spider spins a web, there are habitual liars who spin intricate webs of fake news. And just as a spider uses his web as a cover-up to catch its prey, habitual liars try to cover up the web of lies they've told. Sad to say there are some politicians who have a reputation of being liars. I would just remind all of us the word of God in Revelation 21 verse 8 but the cowardly unbelieving abominable that is the vile, the corrupt murderers sexually immoral sorcerers idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What a picture this is of human depravity. In every way imaginable, the people of Judah gave vent to their wickedness, the wickedness that was in their hearts. The same is true in our day. And thus we read in verse number 8, the way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Turn over a page in your Bible to Isaiah 57, verse 20 and 21. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot press whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God. We've seen in verses 3 through 8 the depravity of the times in which we live. I want to just speak to you for a moment about the futility of the times in which we live. Verses 9 through 11 tell us that the futility of these times is due to spiritual blindness. Let's just read it for a moment. Therefore justice is far from us, nor 
does righteousness overtake us? We look for light. There's darkness. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like a blind man. We grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, for deliverance, but it is far from us. A spiritually blind person tries to find his way through the darkness, but he cannot find it. It's like he has no eyes, and he's groping about, and he can't see where he's going. He stumbles in broad daylight. He becomes frustrated because he cannot find his way. And oh, I fear that our nation has lost its way. We are like a group of people without any eyes trying to find our way this way. And that. Maybe this politician will help. Maybe that politician. Friend, we need God. Amen. Amen. We need Amen. Jesus. Becoming frustrated, he begins to growl like a bear and moan sadly like a dove. The picture is of a bear who is hungry for food and growls because his hunger hasn't been satisfied. I would not want to get in the way of that bear. He's hungry. He's growling. And that's the, that's the spirit. You hear the growling in our news media. People upset with this and that. Frustrated. Not only that, at the same time, the moaning dove speaks of mourning and grief. How many in our nation have been mourning and grieving because of where our nation is right now. And that was the situation in the land of Judah. The prophet Isaiah knew what it was to mourn and to grieve over the sins of the people in the land. In vain, the spiritually blind person looks for justice. He looks for deliverance, but there is none. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in, whom, in, in whose minds the God of this age has blinded the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. The futility of these times is also due to being spiritually backslidden. Verses 12 and 13. For our transgressions are multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. Did you get that? Departing from the living God. Verse 13 tells us that the people of Judah had departed from the Lord. And yet Judah had the godly example of several kings, among whom were Hezekiah and Josiah. Let me just read about Hezekiah, 2 Kings, chapter 18, verses 5, 6, and 7. He, that is Hezekiah, trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded him, had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered him wherever he went. And then you read about King Josiah in, in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 2. 
He, that is Josiah, did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. Yes, the nation of Judah had the benefit of several godly kings, but now, now the nation was in a backslidden condition. In our nation's history, there were two great spiritual awakenings that directly affected our nation for generations. The first was right before the Revolutionary War, and the second happened before the Civil War. And now we, like Judah, have slidden backward. And you ask, how? Verse 13, in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God. Speaking of oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the, from the heart words of So many of our citizens think that all that they are against is whatever cause it is, and racial injustice, whatever cause they think. But my friend, a cause does not justify sin. And these people have, in, in our scripture in Judah, their transgressions were multiplied against the Lord. And that's what has happened in America. Our transgressions, our sin, have multiplied against the Lord so that the Lord has hidden his face from us. And we departed from the living God. The word transgression literally means to be in revolt, to be in rebellion against the Lord. The sins of the depraved are not only against society, they are sins against God Almighty. The lying, the oppression, and revolt are known by God. Whether it's done by wicked policemen, and, and, and sad to say there are some wicked uh, policemen, and we need, uh, you know, we need to, uh, you know, take stock and get right before God. It's not just those who are reacting, it's some wicked police as well. Or whether it's the wicked rioters. As I said a moment ago, their cause doesn't make them right before God. Sins are against God Almighty, and we need to understand there is an accountability on the part of every official and every citizen before God Almighty. Whether it's done by wicked rioters or wicked policemen or whomever, our sins testify against us. The prophet Hosea put it this way in Hosea chapter 4 verse 2. By, by swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraints with bloodshed upon bloodshed. Things got so bad in verse 12, our transgressions are, are multiplied against you. When Ezekiel prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 21, or verse 51, he said about Jerusalem, and I quote, Samaria did not commit half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they. And Proverbs chapter 29, verse 16, when the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases, but the righteous see their fall. So we see the futility of these times are due to spiritual blindness, being spiritually black backslidden, and might I just add this word, being spiritually broken, just broken. Look at verse 14. Justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar off. 
For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Not only is justice turned back, verse 9 tells us that justice is far from us. You know, there can be no justice without truth and righteousness. But I hasten on. I must add this word. The utility of our times is also due to being spiritually besieged. That's a good word there, besieged. Verses 15 and 16. So truth fails. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him, and his own righteousness it sustained him. When truth is no longer accepted or valued, Christians who do not agree with or participate in society's sins often become harassed and ill-treated. That's what it's saying here in our scripture in verse 15. He who departs from evil makes himself a prey. You just don't go along with everybody else. No? We have a political party calling everybody stupid that doesn't you know, agree with what they think. Not them or you. But nonetheless, Micah the prophet put it this way in chapter 7, verse 2. The faithful man has perished from the earth, and there is no one, no one upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. Every man hunts for his brother with a net. Archaeologists digging in the remains of a school for imperial pages in Rome. You know what a page is. They have them in the Senate. These young men, young women who serve, you know, the congressmen. They found the remains of a school for imperial pages in Rome. Uh, they found a picture dating from the third century. It shows a boy standing with his hand raised, worshiping a figure on a cross. And scrawled in the writing of a young person are the words, Alexa Menos worships his God. Nearby, in a second inscription, Alex, uh, is this inscription, Alex Meadows is faithful to his God. And apparently a young man who was being, who was a Christian, was being mocked by his schoolmates for his faithful witness. But he was not ashamed. He was faithful. And verse 15, the latter part of verse 15, then the Lord saw it, and it destroyed. Him. Literally translated, it was evil in his eyes. When God allows us to see things as he sees them, it should motivate us to action. There was no one found involved in intercessory prayer. Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30 emphasizes this thought as well. So I looked for a man among them who would make a wall and stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. How is it with you? Will you intercede in prayer for America? Will you intercede in prayer for lost souls? Will you intercede in prayer for this election? 
in the battle. Look at the last part of verse 19. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. The picture here, as I have studied it, and I've studied it, the picture here is of a raging, mighty river that sweeps away everything in its path. It's just a raging torrent. All the dirt, all the muck, all the mire, all the debris along uh, the river's path, and it just overflows its bank, just raging so mightily, sweeping everything in its path. Everything in its path has no chance when the river is at flood stage. When everything appears hopeless, we have this promise. The Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against him. And the best picture that I can give you here from the Old Testament, I think it's such a beautiful picture. This really gives, I think, really perspective on the Lord raising up his banner is in Exodus chapter 14 and verses 21 through 27. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on the dry ground, <clears throat> And the waters were a wall to them on the right hand and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning, in the morning watch, that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. He took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians, on their chariots, and on their horses. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth, yeah. while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Friend, the Spirit of the Lord raises up a standard against the enemy. You get an idea of all the muck and the mire and the filth and the debris that, that, that this mighty river of evil is sweeping through. You know what it is. We've read about it. The hands, the feet, the tongue, everything involved in evil. I want to tell you, my friend, that the Lord Almighty is a standard against anything that comes against him. Praise his name. Have you felt overwhelmed by all the rioters wreaking havoc in our city? Have you felt sick of all the lying and mocking and false accusations we hear and read about on the internet and hear in the news? Have you felt threatened by socialist, communistic uh, stances by some politician? People? My friend, Look at verse 18. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, rent of recompense to his enemies. The coastlands he will fully repay. It doesn't matter how far and how wide, even to the coastland. The victory to God brings us complete. My friend, be not afraid. Our Lord is clothed. Battle. He is up to the challenge.
judge of the battle, and he is the conqueror of the battle. Look at verse 19 and 20. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. The Redeemer will come to Zion, and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, says the Lord. When Isaiah shared this prophecy, people were looking for Messiah. And Isaiah said, the Redeemer will come to Zion. Praise God. And he did come. And he did stretch out his arms at Calvary. And he did win the victory. Jesus was the conqueror at Calvary. And he is the conqueror at the end of the age. For our Redeemer is coming. And he will settle yeah. the yeah. kingdom in Jerusalem. And I praise the name yeah. of the Lord. That when God wins a victory, it's a complete, total victory. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, I just have this word for you, friend. In your own personal life, in your own in the lives of your family, friends, making it personal. Have you felt like there just was a raging river coming against you? A raging river of problems. Whether it's pain. Financial issues, strained relationships, whether it's economic woes, whatever the problem is. And you have just felt like it's just a raging river, and it's just like you are a salmon trying to swim against the current and fight against all these things that have come against you. And my dear friend, I have a word for you this morning. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. The Lord is here to touch you and to minister to you, and the raging river of life's problems that have come against you. Thank God, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up his hand. Hallelujah. Strong in the Lord and in power of his might. Don't you dare throw in the towel and give up and say it isn't worth following Jesus. Right. Friend, right. it's worth following Jesus for if God gave me ten thousand lifetimes, I want to live every one of them with Jesus Christ. My dear friend, your problems, your situation is not too difficult for God. So we're going to close the service, but I want to give you the opportunity if you want to come for prayer, be anointed. We will anoint you and pray for you. You're going through deep waters. My friend, the Lord's hand is not sure. He still saves. His ear is not heavy, and he's not going to listen. He hears. His face is turned toward you and me, but our sins separate us from God. We can't even sense that God is even looking at us. See what you're going through. I'm going to ask Kim uh, to come and lead us in a song, some kind of worship song, and uh, as we sing, I'm just going to ask my wife to join me here at the front, and we will just anoint you Pray for you and uh, just believe God together on your behalf. Okay? So, uh, as we do this, I want to just encourage you in your prayers to bow your seat and uh, we will join you in prayer. Come right up.
as the Father sent me, so send I you to bear witness of me in spirit and truth.